10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello, my friends. And thank you so much for coming to spend part of your Tuesday, January 23rd with me. You see, there are a lot of you waiting here, and I know that a lot of you have heard these letters read already, but I'm here to read them for you again and interpret them as best I can using my 30 years of legal experience as a New York State trial lawyer in both state and federal courts. So I see a lot of chatters here today. So save your questions because I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I've heard from a lot of you since last night when these letters were released. There are eight of them. They were released last night, I think on Twitter. And I think Ted Daniel then released the bulk of them on the Boston 25 website. And a lot of people didn't understand what they meant. And a lot of people said, I've tried to read the same sentence five times and I still don't understand what it means. And I don't know if you have any insight into them, but I'm gonna give you mine. And then you can uh, let me know what you think at the end. And we're gonna play some interesting clips in between to sort, sort of take us through the timeline of when these letters were written and what they may have been responding to and public statements that were made by the district attorney. And I think it's gonna be interesting. What say you? By the way, I have the What Say You merch and it's linked to the uh, to this video. So take a look for that. It says, What Say You? With a cupcake with a line through it. Because if you're just tuning in today and you don't know who I am, I'm Melanie Little. I'm a recovering lawyer. I'm now a legal analyst and commentator. I'm also a mother of five. So you're going to get all of those perspectives from me. And as my logo says here, I'm not a cupcake. I have this pink sign behind me that says, You can't make everyone happy. You are not a cupcake. And I've had that since. I guess since I became a mother of two, because that's when you really have to start focusing on more than one kid. And I always had to remind myself that I can't make everyone happy and I can't. And you're going to get my opinions. This is not a neutral channel. And I just think that that would be boring if it was a neutral channel. If you like to watch a neutral channel, then there's plenty of channels out there that have photo montages narrated by robot voices. And if that's something that you'd like to, um, watch, then I, then I encourage you to do that. But this is a, a channel where I'm going to share my opinions. You're not always going to like them. I do. I do respect difference of opinions as long as they are respectful. And I have found that with this case, there is more vitriol than any case that I've ever co covered. And uh, even the Maya case, you know, even when we covered the Maya Kowalski case, there was a lot of vitriol on Reddit and stuff about people that were for the defense, who was a hospital and against the plaintiff. But we didn't see the personal attacks that I'm seeing in this case on all forms of social media. And I just, I don't understand why. I think it's, um, I don't understand why we can't disagree, but do it in a respectful way. So that's what I'm here for. Keep it classy in the chat, you guys. My moderators are the best on YouTube. I'm not afraid to say it, they really are. And so we keep it classy. We keep it PG because we want everyone to be able to watch this. I have viewers who say, I'm so happy that my mom, who's 92 years old, has some place to watch true crime because it's clean. So we like to keep it that way. Okay. All right. Guide your actions accordingly because my mods are the best. They will time you out. They will block you. Um, we're just not fooling around here. So let's go. Last night, which was January 22nd of 2024. The eight letters were released between the feds and the district attorney's office of Norfolk County with regard to the Karen Reed case. The Commonwealth had made a motion to keep these letters under seal. The defense, Karen Reed's attorneys, argued against that and told the judge that, hey, look, we're going to be arguing what's in these letters when we argue our motion to disqualify and motion for sanctions and motion to dismiss the indictment on February 15th. So they're going to become public anyway. And in addition to that, the U.S. Attorney's Office chimed in and said, we don't mind if you release them, Judge. So last night they were released, all eight of them. We're going to go through them right now. Try and save your questions for the end because I cannot possibly watch the chat 
while I'm also trying to read this very, very, very small font. Um, so that would be great. The first letter is dated May 9th of 2023, and it is from Joshua Levy. I know it's it's spelled Levy, and I would say Levy, but I have seen a lot of uh, newscasters and other people who are actually from the Boston area calling him Levy, so I'm going to call him Josh Levy. And this is from the assistant district attorney. Uh, Josh Levy is the first assistant at, at this time on May 9th of 2023, he was the first assistant U.S. attorney for the district of Massachusetts. Rachel Rollins was the U.S. attorney for the district of Massachusetts. And we'll get into that. Your first assistant Levy. I write to follow up on our conversation regarding the issuance of federal grand jury subpoenas to at least two witnesses to the Commonwealth's investigation into the death of John O'Keefe. I want to point out right away that it is not mentioned that he is a police officer. She does not say officer John O'Keefe, O'Keefe police officer, John O'Keefe, Boston police officer, John O'Keefe. She may say that later on but it doesn't merit enough importance to be in the first paragraph of this letter. As you know, indictments have been issued in Norfolk Superior Court and the prosecution is ongoing. See Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. As a prosecuting agency, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office has the constitutional duty to provide the defendant with exculpatory evidence. The obligation in Massachusetts to provide exculpatory information pursuant to Brady v. Maryland and its progeny means, quote, not only the constitutional obligation to disclose exc exculpatory information, but also the broad obligation under our rules to disclose any facts that would tend to exculpate the defendant or tend to diminish his or her culpability. Under the Massachusetts Rules of Criminal Procedure, mandatory discovery includes all facts of an exculpatory nature and all statements of witnesses. I am going to stop to point out I don't think it's necessary for the Norfolk County District Attorney to school the U.S. Attorney on the obligations of a prosecutor and to actually cite case law like Brady because it's very well known and duh. To effectuate our discovery obligations, we are requesting at the earliest possible opportunity discovery of all statements of witnesses to the investigation. and grand jury minutes. Okay, I'm gonna start that again. This font is so small that I'm gonna squint. So just excuse me for a second. To effectuate our discovery obligations, we are requesting at the earliest possible opportunity, discovery of all statements of witnesses to the investigation of the death of John O'Keefe and resulting prosecution, including both statements to investigators and grand jury minutes. Again, no mention that he's a Boston police officer. The Commonwealth also has the duty at the time we become aware that statements of witnesses exist to notify the defendant of items under Rule 14 that the prosecutor knows to exist but are not within the care, custody, or control of the prosecution and to provide all information known to the item's location and the identity of the persons possessing that item. And then there is a very, very, very tiny footnote that says, well, at this time, Gives, given the limited disclosure of information, this office is aware only that your investigation is likely to produce statements of witnesses through their grand jury testimony and through my interview of those. Well, that's really even super smaller, so I'm going to have to pull it up on another screen. But it should be pointed out here that this first letter was preceded by a phone call. So this is sort of like confirming their phone call and following up in writing. Let's 
to what they think that they're entitled to and sort of, in my opinion, um, trying to explain to the the U.S. attorney what their obligations are, which I don't really think is a very good idea or smart tactic, but nobody asked me. See Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14, Commonwealth v. Mitchell. We appreciate the sensitivity and need for discretion as to any ongoing federal investigation. While we are unaware of the parameters of federal activity, we cannot forego our constitutional or state duties. We are willing to file a motion for a protective order under Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14A6 to request limitation of the disclosure of the information to defense counsel only. Any decision of such request, of course, is solely within the authority of the Norfolk Superior Court Judge, who in this case is Judge Canoni. I, I, again, Ted Daniel pronounces it Canoni. I would say Canone, but if he says Canoni, I guess I got to say Canoni. Unless you guys tell me otherwise. Footnote two says, under Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14A, B, 2, a party to the state criminal proceeding may move for an order for any individual agency or other entity in possession, custody, or control of items relating to the state criminal case to preserve such items for a specified time. It is cannoli. Okay, says Brendan. Like cannoli. That's what I was thinking. Cannoli. 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 Thank you. Similarly, we are willing to facilitate the process or to a request under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 6E3E. E, one or four for authorization from a federal district court judge for production of the grand jury minutes and related material, if any. Additionally, this office has constitutional and state obligations to provide exculpatory information of which we are aware in all cases, including exculpatory information relating to all witnesses and or members of the prosecution. So again, they're well aware of their obligations to provide exculpatory evidence. And this is in May of 2023. The death of police, Boston police officer John O'Keefe was on January 29th of 2022. So this is already a year and four months into discovery. And they still haven't turned over much to the defense at this point, but it's pointing out that they're aware of their duty to do so all the way back in May of this year. Additionally, this office, oh, did I just read that part? This would include any investigation into misconduct related to professional duties. If any such information exists, it is imperative that we learn of it in a timely manner. I want to point out that all of a sudden they're worried about timeliness. We're going to watch a little bit of a hearing that happened in September of this year, over four months after this letter was written, in which the defense is still fighting to get basic discovery. This would include any investigation into misconduct related to professional duties. If any such information exists, it is imperative that we learn of it in a timely manner. In sum, while we appreciate the notification that subpoenas issued, it is imperative that at the earliest opportunity, we are able to provide discovery to the defendant. So it sounds to me, were they notified? by the U.S. Attorney's Office that they issued subpoena or were they notified by the witnesses? This was preceded by a phone call, remember? So at least two witnesses to the Commonwealth's investigation into the death of Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe notified Mr. Morrissey or someone in his office that they had received subpoenas 
to testify in front of a federal grand jury. I think that's how they found out. And that's what precipitated this letter. Nick Cronin says Massachusetts DA has a history of not having discovery handled timely. So he may have been called. Maybe the maybe the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office reached out to them directly by phone call and told them, but it wasn't by letter. But it sounds to me from that letter that he says that he had been told by two witnesses and maybe that precipitated a phone call to him. It doesn't really say who called who. The next letter is dated May 18th of 2023. This is about not even 10 days later. And this is from the Office of Professional Sp Responsibility. No, this is to the Office of Professional professional responsibility from Marcy's office. And this letter is four pages. Okay, May 18, 2023. To the Office of Pro Professional Responsibility at the U.S. Department of Justice, regarding investigation by the Office of the U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts. Dear sir or madam, I write to formally request that an ongoing investigation being conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts be examined by the Office of Professional Responsibility, and should the investigation continue, that it be transferred to another office without history of conflict, bias, and abuse of prosecutorial discretion, as outlined below. The Norfolk District Attorney's Office has undertaken an extensive investigation into the facts and circumstances of the death of John O'Keefe in Canton, Massachusetts on January 29th, 2022. Again, no mention that he's a Boston police officer until the next paragraph. The facts and evidence gathered, including more than 40 individuals testifying before the Norfolk County Grand Jury, led to the second degree murder indictment of Karen Reed. Reed was the operator of the vehicle that, the evidence demonstrates, struck her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe. O'Keefe was then left to die in the snow on the side of Fairview Road, Canton, during the evening of January 29, 2022. The case has been systematically making its way through Norfolk Superior Court with ongoing discoveries still active and open, including motions under advisement and motions not yet heard and also including a lot of discovery that has not yet been turned over. And it's more than a year, 16 months after the incident. The defendant through counsel has been raising specious issues of a third party culprit, culprit and complaints of witnesses and police misconduct as they attempt to confuse by offering not different interpretations of Commonwealth statements, evidence, and positions, but inventing them out of whole cloth. No actual substantiated evidence supporting police misconduct or any federal violations have been identified by the defendant, the district attorney's office, or the Massachusetts Superior Court during the ongoing discovery process. Approximately three weeks ago, multiple state witnesses who have been brought before the state grand jury notified the Norfolk District Attorney's Office that they were contacted by the FBI and subsequently received subpoenas to appear before a federal grand jury. Shortly after those notifications, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, Joshua Levy, first assistant in the Boston office of the U.S. Attorney's Office, contacted Norfolk First District Attorney, first assistant district attorney, Lynn Beland, is that how you pronounce her name? Beland, Beland, to suggest that they were conducting an investigation that may involve a number of witnesses in the Commonwealth v. Reed murder case. So first, the witnesses contacted the DA's office to tell him or them that they were subpoenaed to testify in front of a federal grand jury. And after that, 
Then Joshua Levy called to tell them. So the notification first came from state witnesses, perhaps Trooper Proctor, perhaps some other law enforcement members that were called to testify in front of the federal grand jury who called up Morrissey and said, hey, I've been called to testify in front of a federal grand jury. What should I do? It's quite possible. That's how he was put on notice. That's what it clearly says right here. At that time, attorney Beland expressed some concerns about both the jurisdiction and the timing of any actions being taken by the U.S. Attorney's Office as they could imprudently impact the ongoing murder prosecution of Karen Reed. This is an interesting one. Get ready. Buckle up. Based on the collective experience of several of my colleague, Massachusetts District Attorneys, and a former federal prosecutor, it appears to be unprecedented for the federal government to step into the middle of an ongoing state murder prosecution prompted only by inflammatory and ethically dubious defense strategy. So right there, he's calling the defense attorneys unethical and he's assuming that the federal government is only investigating the investigation into the Karen Reed case as some sort of personal attack on him and or because one of the defense attorneys called up and said, hey, you should look into this. And really, do you think that's what the federal government is going to do? They're going to drop everything and investigate this case because of a personal vendetta or inflammatory and ethically dubious defense strategy, according to him? In the conversation with first assistant Norfolk District Attorney Lynn Beland, assistant United States Attorney Joshua Levy declined to identify what jurisdiction the federal government had in this murder case. As if she said, tell me what your jurisdiction is. As if he needed to answer that question. I'm, I'm really, um, it's a little, um, I don't know, beyond the pale. It would appear to be a highly unusual and possibly abusive exercise of power. Attorney Levy indicated that the U.S. Attorney's Office was still proceeding ahead with an investigation that would involve individuals who are active participants in events and or witnesses in the state case. Attorney Beland reminded AUSA Joshua Levy that any statements and or testimony taken in such an investigation that pertain to any of the witnesses in the ongoing state murder trial may create an ongoing obligation for state prosecutors to provide defense with access to all information and statements gathered or recorded as a result of the federal investigation. The U.S. Attorney's Office offered the opinion that, quote, you can't turn over information that you don't have, end quote. This position leaves the state authorities potentially unable to meet the constitutional mandate expressed in Brady v. Maryland and corresponding Massachusetts state rules. That indicates to me that he is very, very, very concerned that whatever the feds have already uncovered is potentially exculpatory for Karen Reed, and he wants to know about it now. He wants to get ahead of it. And this is in May. This was May 18th of 2023. And the accusation that The U.S. Attorney's Office is abusing its exercise of power is a pretty inflammatory accusation to make, in my opinion. What say you? I need to come to the chat for a moment. Back after this, this is beyond comical. CL, so the U.S. Attorney's Office had nothing. That's odd. Did they state why they started this investigation? No, and they don't have to. They don't have to. 
again, a fishing expedition by Marcy. Yeah, he's trying to find out what they have. And he really, really wants to know. And you're going to see as the letters go on how much more desperate they kind of become. I would love to hear those grand jury minutes. Mindy says they didn't even turn over the stuff they did have. <laughs> Hi, Jules. Thanks for joining. Good to see you. Lynn says abusive exercise of power. He should be quite familiar with that. Get back after this. I demand you stop your investigation now. And if you're not going to stop it, I will accept that you transfer it out of Massachusetts and give it to somebody else because they don't like me. They don't like me. That's what it sounds like to me. It's my interpretation of this letter. People are going to disagree. I know it. Since that call concluded, we have confirmed that witnesses have testified before the grand jury rules, before the grand jury, period. Rule six of the federal rules of criminal procedure allows that under certain compelling circumstances, information may be provided to all counsel, including those not before the federal grand jury. Recent court filings and statements by defense counsel in the Reed matter suggest that the defense attorneys were the source of the initial complaint and allegations prompting this action by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Quoting a report from the Boston Herald, or an article from the Boston Herald. Reed's defense counsel's recent court filings raise out of thin air and apparently purposeful misstatement of fact, unsupported claims of a cover-up by investigators and witnesses including municipal, state, and federal law enforcement. As shown in attached documents, many or all of the unsupported allegations can be vetted and reviewed by the judges of the Massachusetts Superior Court during the discovery and motion sessions or available appellate review. Again, I will submit to you, we've seen many hearings after May where the judge in the Superior Court, Judge Canoni, has quashed non-party witness subpoenas, has forced the defense to argue motions on days when they weren't supposed to argue motions. And there's been a lot of things that the judge of the superior court in this case has not permitted the defense to do. They had to go up on appeal on one of the issues regarding Brian Albert's phone and Jen McCabe's phone. So I think that that idea of Councillor Morrissey's wasn't uh, wasn't such a great one. I am unaware and strongly doubt any prosecutor or state police misconduct in Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. The only allegations to that effect have been unsupported claims or, de in, or in defense filings that had not even been answered. At the time, USA, Le AUSA Levy confirmed the existence of a federal grand jury. It's almost, it, it, it almost is like Heath Off protests too much. This is a four page letter that is really repetitive, defensive. questioning the ethics of the investigators in this investigation, the feds. And it just makes me go, hmm. It raises the question of why the apparatus of the DOJ would intervene, even as such issues are still being assessed by a justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court without some additional impetus on the part of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Hmm. So obviously he's inferring some sort of nefarious purpose here, some other impetus that has really nothing to do with the Karen Reed case, but is either a personal attack on him or someone in his administration or one of the members of law enforcement involved in this case. I predicate the following information. I skipped a sentence again. 
Without dismissing the important role of the DOJ in investigating the allegations of police misconduct and federal violations, we bring your attention to what appears to be additional concerns concerning motive, conflict, or appearance of conflict, and potential bias by the Office of the U.S. Attorney from Massachusetts, which might explain the unprecedented proceedings. I predicate the following information with the fact that it has been the policy of the Norfolk Attorney's Office during my 12-year tenure as District Attorney to maintain a close working relationship with the U.S. Attorney from Massachusetts. Notable in this relationship was the cooperation of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office in the prosecution of a 35-year-old murder case that was committed in Sharon, Massachusetts, which involved the Whitey Bulger Gang in U.S. versus Fleming. The Norfolk District Attorney's Office had statutory jurisdiction to pursue the case, but in the interest of cooperation, acceded to the request of the U.S. Attorney at the time to allow federal prosecutors to proceed with the case. As a result of that agreement, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office and Massachusetts State Police, assigned to the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, worked closely with the U.S. Attorney's Office on the case. During this period, AUSA Dustin Chow without nexus to that prosecution, asked a Massachusetts state police detective involved in the matter if he had any kind of damaging information on the district attorney, first assistant, or the Norfolk district attorney's office. He's saying, we, we did cooperate with you. We've always been cooperative with you. And look what happened when we cooperated with you. Someone turned on us. This sua sponte question was not without context. Laura G. Chow, Dustin's wife, had been an employee of the Norfolk District Attorney's Office prior to the case mentioned above. Not long into her tenure, it became apparent to her superiors that she required more seasoning and legal experience if she was to succeed in a superior court role. She was offered the chance to gain more trial experience in the district court without any loss of compensation. Instead, she resigned and filed an ethics violation complaint with the Massachusetts board of bar overseers against the first assistant in the Norfolk district attorney's office. The complaint before the board was summarily dismissed in short order. Laura Chow was instead cited for a violation of her ethical obligations to provide accurate address information for her practice. Long after separation, she was misrepresenting her address as the Norfolk DA's office. Okay. I don't know what that whole two very long paragraphs or three very long paragraphs of word salad was or what the relevance is in this case. But it looks, it sounds like he's trying to say, listen, we did try and cooperate with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Whitey Bulger case and look what happened. They turned against us and you can't let that happen again. I began composing this letter well before the May 17, 2023 publication of the DOJ Office of the Inspector General Report 23-071, which has apparently prompted the resignation of the current U.S. Attorney of the District of Massachusetts. That was Rachel Rollins, who in fact did resign one day after this letter was written. My attention is drawn to several portions of Section 2, particularly as they pertain to the weaponization of the U.S. Attorney's Office for personal, political, and retributive process, purposes, purposes. Page 46. Hayden, quote, will, will, regret, will regret the day he did this to you. Watch. We asked Rollins whether her disclosure was retribution for the wrongs she believed Hayden had committed. Additionally, we determined that days after Hayden prevailed in the September 6th primary election, Rollins sought to damage Hayden's reputation. The evidence demonstrated she used her position as U.S. attorney in an ultimately unsuccessful effort to create the impression publicly that DOJ was or would be investigating Hayden for public corruption. These DOJ findings and questions reinforce my belief that the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts must be removed from whatever investigation is being conducted into the Reed matter. I believe that a reasonable person could conclude that the same type of tactics are being employed against the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office into the Reed investigation. 
The outgoing U.S. attorney has made no secret of her personal animosity towards me, including repeated crude, outlandish personal and professional attacks against me in the media during her time as Suffolk District Attorney. See Exhibit E. The exhibits, by the way, were not released, only the letters. The head of the Public Corruption Unit has raised the specter of personal retaliation for his wife's departure from the Norfolk District Attorney's Office. The public has the right to a U.S. Attorney's Office that is fair and unbiased as it executes its responsibilities. Weaponizing the U.S. Attorney's Office to conduct an unprecedented intervention into an open state murder case appears to raise the same concerns outlined in the DOJ's report. Apparently, he's now accusing the U.S. Attorney's Office of being corrupt. Therefore, they should not invest his, they should not investigate his investigators for corruption because they too are corrupt and biased and have it out for him. I submit that the pattern of using the U.S. AO for personal purposes established in report 23-071 coupled with the obvious conflict of AUSA Chow make it impossible to conclude that a fair evaluation of the unprecedented Reed intervention can be conducted by any party within the Massachusetts office. It's impossible to determine how far the tentacles of bias have spread out from the chief of the relevant unit and the titular head of the office. I got to read that again for emphasis and also because it may be a good merch idea for someone. Tentacles of bias. It is impossible to determine how far the tentacles of bias have spread out from the chief of the relevant unit and the titular head of the office. I formally request that an impartial federal official unaffiliated with the U.S. Attorney's Office for Massachusetts review and investigate the steps and actions that are being taken by current members of the Massachusetts office, exploring this apparent bias and whether it predisposed them to abuse their prosecutorial discretion in this matter. In the unlikely case that an impartial review finds that a DOJ investigation into the Karen Reed matter is appropriate, even before the issues at hand have been vetted by the Norfolk Superior Court judge hearing the case, I request that the investigation be reassigned from parties with clearly stated and documented bias against members of the Norfolk District Attorney's Office to attorneys entirely outside the office of the U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts. Love, Michael Morrissey, District Attorney for the Norfolk District. Hmm. The unlikely case that an impartial review finds that a DOJ investigation into the Karen Reed matter is appropriate. He says that's very unlikely that they're going to, in their impartiality, that they would, even in their wildest dreams, consider that there should be an investigation into the Karen Reed matter. It's ballsy. I mean, I'll give them that. Next letter is June 1, but I think we need to come to the chat for a moment. What say you, my friends? What say you? For those of you who are not from the Boston area, I'm going to point out to you that uh, Michael Marcia is a lifetime politician, as far as I could tell. He went to, he got his undergrad degree at UMass Amherst, his law degree at the University of Suffolk. And then he got his master's in public administration from Western, Western New England College. He's a lifelong resident of Quincy, Massachusetts. And from 1977 to 1992, he served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. From 1992 until 2010, he was a state senator from Norfolk and Plymouth, Plymouth District. And in 2010, he was elected the district attorney of Norfolk County. So 15 years as a Massachusetts State House of Representatives. 18 years as a state senator. And so far, 13 or 14 years 
as DA, career politician, right? So me as an outsider, not being from Boston, um, I feel like he's trying to um, <laughs> wield some influence here. Uh, look, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this a lot longer than you guys have. And I don't know how old these people are that he's addressing, but I'm a little, it's a little patronizing in my opinion. My opinion. Tom Honnold, he's a Democrat in Massachusetts. He runs unopposed every time. Guaranteed job for life. Is there no term limit to how long the district attorney can serve in Massachusetts? RTD, he protesteth too much, definitely trying to hide bias investigation. I do, Care Bear. I do have his public statement from last year. We're going to watch it. But I want to watch it in order because his statement came out in August. So we're going to do this in order because we want to see what letters were going back and forth between them before he made that statement. So I think the timeline's kind of important here. <laughs> Alana Melanie with the Marcy background check. Well, I had to give a little, uh, you know, resume on him. I, I don't live locally in Boston, so I needed to know, you know, is he a new DA? Did he serve as a prosecutor for the entirety of his career until he was elected? Uh, no, he's a politician. So you don't try a lot of cases when you're in the Massachusetts House of Representatives and you don't try a lot of cases as a state senator. So that was the first 15 plus 18 years of his career from 1977 to 2010. Quincy, Quincy, I was going to say Quincy. I was going to say Quincy. I don't know that he was a practicing attorney or was he trying cases during the time that he was in the House of Representatives and as a state senator because there was a mention that he had a law firm. I don't know. No, let's say you. Brittany Redfern says, guys, got huge balls to call everyone else out. Sunflower Day, yes, I agree, Melanie. Timeline is important. Oh, Chris Haley, thank you for that. No term limits in Massachusetts. He runs unopposed. All right, so there's that. Janine, thank you. Once again, elections have consequences. Map says he won't be elected again. When is he up for re-election? Anybody know? Listen, people, you got to get out and vote. You got to get out and vote. People think on these elections that are not presidential that it's not important to get out and vote. It is. It's, it's important. Carol Mary says, Marcy was overheard talking about the case at his class reunion in Quincy. Extremely unprofessional. Kirsten says, I wonder why nobody opposes him. Tyrone, yeah, most Dems, Dems in mass or lifers never have to worry about a real job, one party state. Well, I found this really interesting because he's a lifelong resident of Quincy. Just like somebody pointed out to me, 80 or 81% of members of the Canton PD were born and raised Canton. So people don't seem to leave. Chelsea says the way politicians get to go unchecked is criminal. Such a lack of check and, checks and balances. I mean, I think we're seeing it here. Bob Weir is back in the chat. Hi, Bob. Marcy blames everything on Rachel Rollins, but she was out of office in May of 2022. Well, thanks for bringing that up because I want to just talk a little bit about Rachel Rollins. Rachel Rollins. In July of 2021, President Joe Biden nominated Rollins to be the U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts. Republican U.S. Senator Tom Cotton said he would try to prevent Rollins from being confirmed, saying she supported policies that have contributed to an increase in violent crime. Senator Ted Cruz also criticized her for stating she would not prosecute certain crimes, such as trespassing, breaking and entering, larceny, resisting arrest, wanton or malicious destruction of property, drug possession with intent to distribute, driving with a suspended or revoked license, and several more. In September of 2021, a committee vote to advance Rollins' nomination was delayed after Cotton wanted more time to convince colleagues to oppose her. But on December 28th of 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris cast a tie-breaking vote on the Senate's motion to invoke cloture on, as well as to confirm Rollins' nomination. Hmm. 
After her confirmation, the U.S. Marshals Service refused Rollins' request for a full-time security detail, assessing that she was at low risk of actual harm after receiving death threats via email. On January 10th of 2022, she was sworn in as the U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts. So she only served for a little over a year because there was an ethics probe into her beginning in November of 2022. So the ethics probe started six months before these letters between Morrissey and the DOJ and the Office of Professional Responsibility and the U.S. Attorney's Office started. There was already an ethics probe going on into Rollins starting in November of 2022. And that had to do with Rollins' appearance at a Democratic National Committee political fundraiser with First Lady Jill Biden, her travel and use of her personal cell phone. Eventually, the Inspector General generated a 161-page report against Rachel Rollins, alleging a broad array of misconduct, including disclosing to a journalist non-public information about a possible Justice Department investigation, soliciting and accepting 30 free tickets to a Boston Celtics game and accepting thousands of dollars from a sports and entertainment agency for fights, for flights and a stay at a luxury resort. According to the report, Rollins tried to influence the outcome of the race to succeed her as Suffolk County District Attorney by repeatedly attempting to sabotage the campaign of her favored candidate's rival. The report also found that she had lied under oath to investigators and she did resign on May 19th of 2023, which was one day after that last letter that we just read together. So that's interesting information. They were already investigating Rollins and yet Marcy was using Rollins' bias as a way to try and get this moved to a different U.S. attorney's office. Hmm. Let's move on now, shall we? The next letter that we have here is dated June 1 of 2023. Brian is going to show the select board meeting live, by the way. LTL at 7 p.m. And if I am available, I may go over and join him just to see what goes on in Canton because it was interesting to me. Somebody asked who's streaming the Canton select meeting tonight. This is a letter to Michael Morrissey from the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility, dated June 1st of 2023. Dear Mr. Marcy, the Office of Professional Responsibility received your May 18th, 2023 letter requesting that OPR investigate the decision by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts to subpoena individuals who are witnesses in your pending state prosecution, Commonwealth v. Reed, to testify before the grand jury in an ongoing federal investigation. You stated that the U.S. Attorney's investigation is, quote, possibly an abusive exercise of power, end quote, and likely based, quote, only, end quote, on defendant Karen Reed's, quote, specious, end quote, claims of, quote, witness and police misconduct, end quote. I love how they turn his words against him and quote them directly, just like I said. In addition to an investigation of the U.S. Attorney's investigation, decision, you requested that OPR transfer the U.S. attorney's pending investigation to another office, quote, without a history of conflict, bias, and abuse of prosecutorial discretion, end quote. OPR has jurisdiction to investigate allegations of misconduct involving Department of Justice attorneys that relate to the exercise of their authority to investigate litigate or provide legal advice, as well as allegations of misconduct by law enforcement personnel that are related to allegations of attorney misconduct within the jurisdiction of OPR. What say you, my friends? They are spelling out for him exactly what their jurisdiction is. And their jurisdiction includes investigating, litigating, providing legal advice, as well as allegations of misconduct by law enforcement personnel that are related 
to allegations of attorney misconduct within the jurisdiction of OPR. The way that was spelled out, if I was the attorney who was receiving this letter, I might start to get a little scared. However, it is the policy of this office to refrain from investigating such issues or allegations if an active investigation is ongoing or litigation is pending. With regard to your request that another office be assigned to the pending grand jury investigation, matter outside of OPR's jurisdiction, OPR forwarded your complaint to the Executive Office for the U.S. Attorneys for whatever action it deems appropriate. Further inquiry, inquiry regarding that issue may be directed to EOUSA General Counsel Jay Macklin at this email address. Thank you for advising OPR of your concerns. Signed, Jeffrey Ragsdale, the attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility. Next letter is on June 12th. And this is from Joshua Levy, the acting U.S. Uh, attorney who took over I think he's the interim U acting U.S. attorney right now after Rachel Rollins' quote resignation because if she resigned, I think she gets to keep her package, pension, et cetera. That's how it works in most <clears throat> federal jobs. If you resign rather than be terminated or removed for cause, you get to keep your benefits and your pension. Pretty sure that's what happened there. So Joshua Levy is now has stepped up from the first assistant to the acting U.S. attorney for the District of Massachusetts. And he's writing to Lynn Beland, the first assistant district attorney in Norfolk County, who is also coincidentally handling the Brian Walsh case because I saw some clips of her started falling into the rabbit hole of Brian Walsh last night when these letters started dropping and then I had to stop what I was doing for these letters, but I want to get back into the um, the Brian Walsh case because it's going to be very interesting because the Google searches in the Brian Walsh case, it's a no body murder case. It's a no body murder case. They need his electronic forensics to be accurate. And all of the Google searches that he did in the same county being prosecuted by the same district attorney need to be accurately timestamped. So, hmm. They're going to have to uh, pick their poison, I guess. You can't say in the Brian Walsh case, all those timestamps are totally accurate, but in Karen Reed's case, yeah, they're not. So there. Thank you for your letter dated May 9th, 2023. My apologies for the delay in responding, but I've been tied up with transition issues. We understand your office has important discovery obligations in any criminal prosecution. At this juncture, we have no issue with you advising defense counsel about the contact we have had with your office and the information we have shared if you determine such a disclosure is warranted under Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14. We are mindful of the important concerns related in your letters and we'll be back in touch with you as circumstances dictate. Signed, Joshua Levy. Okay, we've, we fully know what your obligations are under Brady and we don't have any problem if you tell the defense that we've been talking and what's happening here. Let's say you. <laughs> Madam Raz, what say you? Shield and sword with the electronic data. Can't have it both ways, Michael. That's what I'm saying. And Candy says, and Walsh is even being investigated by Proctor. I mean, this is a really, the tentacles of bias here are really, right? Tentacles of bias are really, really spreading. And there's another one, Lindsay Clancy. Don't they have some Google data on her that they want to say is accurate? Amazing sports mom. Canton was a beautiful place and still is. It's just ugly people that finally going down. They got it going down. Back then, yes, yeah, so many people got away with a lot of corrupt people, but not now. Well, I think this may come too light. Perhaps. Thank you, Maureen, for your super sticker. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Brian. Can't wait for this, for your super sticker and coming in. 
and all these new members. Paula Cat, thank you. Jay Mansfield, thank you. Steph Nye, thank you. Michelle O, I see you. Um, I wish you could teach me how to curate my Instagram so beautifully. <laughs> I mean, your Instagram is out off the hook. Uh, Sons at 107, thank you for becoming a member. I love that. We have a lot of fun here, my friends. We have a lot of fun here. Hi, Choosy Heretics. Uh, thank you so much for your $5 super chat. I can feel the temperature rising. I, You know what? I think in song lyrics, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. And here's another new member. Anna M N Anna Anna M 238. Thank you for becoming a member. Appreciate you. That was June 12th. And actually, he wasn't such a delay in responding because the letter prior to that was on the 1st of June. Here's another letter on June 21 of 2023. That last one was June 12th. This was June 21. This one is from the Norfolk District Attorney's Office to Jay Macklin now. They said, we're transferring this to him. If you want to know something, talk to him. It's not on us. It's on him. If you want somebody to transfer this out of here, that's who you need to talk to. So, and Beland is now writing to General Counsel Macklin, and this is regarding the June 1, 2023 letter from OPR regarding review of conflict of interest. Dear General Counsel Macklin, this letter is to inquire about the status of a request for a transfer of investigation due to a conflict of interest. On May 18, 2023, the Office of the Norfolk District Attorney sent to the Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility a letter raising concerns as to a potential investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts involving witnesses relating to a pending state criminal matter, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, and the death of John O'Keefe in Canton, Massachusetts on January 29th, 2022. Again, not Boston police officer John O'Keefe, just the death of John O'Keefe in Canton, Massachusetts. I find it disrespectful. I just do. Sorry. I'm going to keep saying it every time I see it. This office has subsequently received a June 1, 2023 letter from Jeffrey Ragsdale, counsel for OPR, reflect, reflecting that to the extent that the letter indicated that the pending grand jury investigation should be reassigned, the appropriate office to address that request was the executive office for the U.S. attorney. This is to inquire about the status of this request and to provide contact information for any further information you may require. If you have any questions or are looking for any additional information, I may be contacted as set out above. So again, this is in, in June. This is after Rachel Rollins resigned. She is no longer the uh, U.S. attorney. But they're still claiming bias and they still want to know what the status of the investigation is. And they really, 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 really want the information. They're dying, dying, dying to know. This is in June. The next letter is August 3rd of 2023. And this is from Jay Macklin, the general counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice. And this is a response to Ms. Belan's last letter. This responds to your June 21, 2023 letter concerning your putative request for a recusal of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts from the pending state criminal matter, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. As you indicate, the Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility informed you that they had referred your May 18th, 2023 letter to my office for whatever action I deem appropriate. Consistent with the terms of the referral from OPR, I contacted acting U.S. Attorney Joshua Levy. Based on my understanding from that discussion with AUSA Levy, his office has a very different position. Wait a second. I need to make this even bigger. His office has a very different opinion of the circumstances in this case than as presented in Mr. Marcy's letter. This office has not reached any official determination whether prosecution is warranted, but they believe it is essential to continue their investigation given the information of which they are aware. 
At this time, we see no basis for a recusal in this investigation. Thank you for your contact information and willingness to provide additional information as needed. What say you? I need to pull that letter up again on the side just so I can read that one more sentence again. I'll tell you what I think of that. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. He says, Joshua Levy's office has a very different opinion of the circumstances in this case than as presented in Mr. Morrissey's letter. It's telling. They see no basis for a recusal of the Massachusetts U.S. attorney in this case. They're on to something. I think they got their tentacles into something. What say you? What say you, Rob Geary? Uh, Kim O'Brien says, uh, Levy knows what's up. Rob Geary says, I can't believe the trolls trying to spin this and say Levy is the corrupt, Levy is the corrupt one conspiring with Karen Reed. And TB like, what in the world? I, I know and I've seen it too. This is not good. <laughs> this is not good. It's not good. And I don't know how you can spin this in any other way. It's not good. He, is, he only put his, um, his name on maybe one of the letters so far. He's trying to distance himself from this by having Lynn Beland write these letters. Uh, this is a thing, you guys. This is a thing. Brendan Paveo, fun fact, Bill Boer's brother is ADA under Marcy. And he has the sickest skullet, skullet, mullet. What are you trying to say? Why do I immediately think of Peter Griffin when I hear Morrissey's name? It's like, mom, mom, mommy, 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 mom, 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 mommy, 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 mommy. Just because you keep saying something doesn't make it so. It doesn't make it so. I don't know. I mean, I think I know what he's trying to do. He's really trying to get some invest some information to see if they're coming, maybe not for him, but one of the troopers, any of the witnesses, anybody in his office. I mean, we've discussed this before. The DA prosecutes the evidence as brought to them by the investigating officers. So unlike somebody else's um, assertions that there needs to be hundreds of people involved in a cover-up, no, there doesn't. KK, blows my mind how a former FBI state agent says nothing to see here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was the letter back on August 3rd. And then the DA goes on TV on August 25th and gives this statement. If you haven't seen this, I'm sure you have. But now we're looking at it in context because we didn't know that all of these letters were flying back and forth between Morrissey's office and the U.S. Attorney's office and the Office of Professional Responsibility. We didn't know that then. So that's why we need to look at it. Now, he came out and did a press conference and this was the statement that he gave to reporters on August 25th of 2023. It's five minutes long, but I think it's it's worth playing the whole thing. Because now we know what was going on behind the scenes. Of its kind in my dozen years as North Park District Attorney. The harassment. One second. Buffering, buffering. This will be the first statement of its kind in my dozen years as Norfolk District Attorney. 
The harassment of witnesses and the murder prosecution of Karen Reed is absolutely baseless. It should be an outrage to any decent person and it needs to stop. Innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. However, what evidence does show is that John O'Keefe never entered the home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton the night he died. Location data from his phone, recovered from the lawn beneath his body when he was transported to the hospital, shows that this phone did not enter that home. Eleven people have given statements that they did not see John O'Keefe enter the home at 34 Fairview that night. Zero people have said that they saw him enter the home. Zero. No one. Some have, without any evidence, pointed to 18-year-old Colin Albert, a nephew of the homeowner, and accused him of attacking John O'Keefe as he entered the home. But phone evidence shows O'Keefe never entered the home at all. Okay, so um, for those people who weren't following this case and didn't even know who Colin Albert w was, um, now the district attorney is publicly naming him, so there's that. You're talking about har harassment of witnesses, but now you're putting this kid's name out there. I don't know that that was such a great idea, but nobody asked me. Although if you ask some of my trolls, they think I'm spinning PR, so maybe I should have been a PR person. Testimony from witnesses tell us that 18-year-old Colin Albert had left his uncle's home before John O'Keefe and Karen Reed had arrived outside the residence. Okay, so witnesses told you that when? You never told, you never turned those those statements over to the defense. His name wasn't even mentioned in the beginning of this case. This is August of 2023. This is a year and eight months after. Got some splaining to do, Mr. Morrissey. There was no fight inside that home. John O'Keefe did not enter the home. Colin Elvin, the young man being vilified, was not present when Reed's vehicle and John O'Keefe arrived on the street. This is a false narrative. Colin Albert didn't commit murder. Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and Brian Albert. These people were not part of a conspiracy and certainly did not commit murder or any crime that night. Be interesting to see how well this ages. I mean, maybe he's right. They have been forthcoming with authority, providing statements, and have not engaged in any cover-up. They are not suspects in any crime. They are merely witnesses in the case. To have them accused of murder is outrageous. To have them harassed and intimidated based on false narratives and accusations is wrong. They are witnesses to what our justice system asks of them. The autopsy of John O'Keefe was conducted by a forensic pathologist from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. The doctor found that the injuries that left John helpless in the cold were not a result of a fight. She further found that the line of abrasions on his arm was consistent with blunt trauma, not an animal attack. Okay, um, I submit to you, and you know that I submit this to you because we, I did a whole stream about it. Medical examiners don't see a lot of dog bites because people don't often die of dog bites. And I don't know that she was qualified to make that determination. And I don't know why he's coming out publicly and saying this. However, I'm going to address this super chat because this is, I think you're right about this. Perhaps Caitlin Poole. Thank you for your $5 super chat. This statement was low key to the DOJ, not the public. This, I think, is the response that he wanted to give them, but he gave it in public, and it's a, it's here forever on the Internet. A grand jury of everyday citizens heard the documented evidence and testimony before making a decision. The subject of that murder indictment enjoys the constitutional presumption of innocence. Why should the witnesses who have committed no crime be afforded less by members of the community. They should not. Okay, if she deserves the constitutional presumption of innocence, why are you on television 
telling everyone that she definitely did it. This is some of the finest word salad that I've ever seen. And I completely agree with him. Witnesses in these types of trials should not be harassed. They should not be, you know, doxxed and, and attacked and publicly humiliated and people putting them out there on the internet. Let, let's let this system do its job. But for him to now come on here and say, everyone's entitled to the presumption of innocence, and then say, but Karen Reed definitely did it and she's definitely guilty and all the evidence shows that, you know, that could be considered tainting the jury pool. What say you? Not be harassed for telling the government what they heard or saw. I'm asking the Canton community and everyone who feels invested in this case to hear all the actual evidence at trial before signing guilt of people who have done nothing wrong. And certainly before taking it upon yourself to harass citizens who evidence shows have done nothing in this matter but come forward and bear witness. We try people in the court and not on the internet for a reason. The internet has no rules of evidence. The internet has no punishment for perjury. And the internet does not know all the facts. Conspiracy theories are not evidence. The idea that multiple police department, EMTs, fire personnel, the medical examiner and prosecuting agencies are joined in or taken in by a vast conspiracy should be seen for what it is, completely contrary to the evidence and a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Michael Proctor. Hold on. A desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Again, thank you, Patriot. He also says this office will not reassign guilt as though he's already assigned guilt to Karen Reed. Case closed. So, so unethical. I call me crazy. I This statement may come back to bite him. And again, this statement may show bias. And again, if they are investigating him, the feds, this statement does not in any way help him. Because by this time, a lot of these, quote, conspiracy theories were in court papers. I don't think he's just talking about, you know, people on YouTube and Reddit threads and people on Twitter, you know, he's saying that the defense and their third party culprit theory is bogus. Yes, Scott, thank you for your $10 super chat. He's bringing up Colin Albert at this time because the feds served him a summons for the federal grand jury. FBI found out Colin was in the house many months. All the witnesses hid the fact. Thank you for your super chat. Yes, we did look at that. We did look at that uh, piece of paper from his school saying that the FBI was there to serve him with a subpoena. And I think you're right. I think it was right around this time. Thanks, Mike, for your super chat. Four ninety nine. They're really hanging their hat on the location data. Defense has the exact opposite stance. Same with the Google search. Battle of the experts incoming. 100%. 100%. But the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office needs to be careful and walk this line very, very carefully because they can't tell the jury in the Brian Walsh case that his Google searches are 100% accurate and his location data is 100% accurate when they are saying in this case Jen McCabe's Google searches are not accurate. The timestamp is wrong. Goes back to when you open the browser window. And all that Apple Health data is wrong. And he didn't walk. And it's all wrong. And he, it, it's not where he says he was. Uh, they're going to have a real problem with credibility in the Brian Walsh case. Again, that's a no-body murder case. Those cases are tough. Again. From what I've seen and read about the Brian Walsh case and his Google search history and all of those other horrible things and video of him buying certain things at Home Depot and, st and such, I think the inference may be made that he actually did it. But in this case, that evidence is a lot less, I think, 
than it is in Brian Walsh. So they need to be, they need to walk this line very, very carefully. And the defense has real experts who really do electronic forensics. And some of the, the programs that, that Trooper Guarino used are not what law enforcement uses. They're consumer type software. So, hmm, yes, yes, yes. I want to highlight this too. Yes, MC. The ME came to her conclusions based on what Proctor told her. He was right there with her during the exam. Right. What medical examiner, when is the last time that you saw an autopsy report that said there was no indication of a fight? Medical examiners don't put in their reports what didn't happen. They put in their reports what did happen. And we saw the same thing, to go back to Murdoch for a second, in the Stephen Smith investigation, when Stephen Smith was found dead in the road near Moselle, near the Murdochs, and the medical examiner called it a car accident because the trooper investigating that case went into the autopsy and said, you need to put in there that it's that it was a car accident. So we're seeing this more often than I would like to see it lately. Uh, the state police trooper being accused of planting evidence outside 34 Fairview Road was never at Fairview Road on the day of the incident. Proctor and his state police partner traveled together the entire day while other officers were processing. Well, this didn't age well, because haven't we found out that Proctor was at the house hmm? more than once? Thanks, Heidi. Column was served April 10th of 2023. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Bigfoot, it's going to be epic to see this video played on Dateline after the truth comes out. Yes, Sobo Ma, it's the timing in this case that's really important. I'm not sure the timing is as important in Brian Walsh, only that he made the search. Yes, I agree. I agree. But again, they're going to have to, they're going to have to argue accuracy, right? And we haven't seen everything in the Brian Walsh case yet either, so. Just one example. I think Lindsay Clancy is another example. Thirty-four Fairview. Trooper Proctor was not there and did not plant evidence at Thirty-four Fairview Road. In addition to having no opportunity to plant the evidence, as has been suggested, Proctor would have no motive to do so. Trooper Proctor had no close personal relationship with any of the parties involved in the investigation. Oh, that didn't age well either, did it? You guys can explain that in the chat, how that didn't age well. No close, close personal ties with any of the, wait, let's see, because it might be word salad, hang on. And had no, having no opportunity to plant the evidence, as has been suggested, Proctor would have no motive to do so. Trooper Proctor had no close personal relationship with any of the parties involved in the investigation and had no conflict. With any of the parties involved in the investigation. Let's break that down. Who was involved in the investigation? Karen Reed. I mean... You have to look when you're watching an attorney speak, understand that attorneys choose their words very, very carefully. And what they don't say is just as important as what they do say. So think about that. Thank you, Sharon Leahy, for your $10 super chat. And thank you for explaining this all senior, but not senile. No, honey, these, these are hard things to understand. And a lot of times you need to know the, the state of mind where people are coming from. And that's why I wanted to do this timeline so that we could see what happened before he made this public statement. Because this public statement, as somebody stated earlier, uh, may have been intended for the DOJ. Caitlin Poole said it earlier. Thank you for Michelle. Be Thank you, Michelle, for becoming a new member. Appreciate you. 
and he had no reason to step out of this investigation. Every suggestion to the contrary is a lie. This should be seen for what it is and not used as a pretext to attack and harass others. What is happening to the witnesses, some with no actual involvement in the case, is wrong. It is contrary to the American values of fairness and the constitutional value of a fair trial. It needs to stop now. I am releasing this recorded statement rather than holding a news conference because my remarks need to be so narrowly tailored to the issue at hand. No, I'm doing this rather than a press conference because I don't want to answer any questions that somebody like Ted Daniel, who's an incredible investigative reporter, might ask me. So I pre-recorded this statement to, to give it all to you because I do not want to take questions. That's what that means. Why did he say he did this? Hold on. I owe a fair trial. I can harass others. What is happening to the witnesses, some with no actual involvement in the case, is wrong. It is contrary to the American values of fairness and the constitutional value of a fair trial. Okay, how about in, in fairness and in the interest of a fair trial, we turn over the evidence to the defense that they're entitled to? How about, how about that? That's what's fair. You turn over the evidence in a timely manner when a woman is being accused and on trial for second degree manslaughter, murder, you turn over the evidence. This statement was made in August of 2023, which again was one year and seven months post the death of police officer, Boston police officer, John O'Keefe. It needs to stop now. I am releasing this quoted statement rather than holding a news conference because my remarks need to be so narrowly tailored to the issue at hand while the prosecution is pending in Superior Court. But the message is the same. And while the investigation is also pending with the feds and the Department of Justice. Hmm. What is happening to these innocent people, these witnesses, is wrong and it needs to stop. Well... I agree. Witnesses should not be harassed. I don't think that anybody should be harassed. I'll agree with that. But he didn't have the wherewithal to want to take questions on this. This was a recorded statement that was just released to the public. It was not press conference. And um, hello, recovery addict raid. I see you guys. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for coming over. I mean, in the interest of fairness, I, I don't think that you get out there and call the defense theories bogus. I don't know. What say you? Yeah, and what say you guys? KCL5, like, how does he know the witnesses are innocent? How does he know they weren't involved? He doth protest too much. He knows now that his office and perhaps the the Investigating officers are under investigation by the feds and he needs to get ahead of it and say, I have no reason to believe that anybody else did this. And again, he doth protest too much. Keelan, he's angry, scared, and bitter. I mean, watching the statement again right now after reading these letters, it, it takes on a whole different meaning to me. What about you? Jennifer H., this is embarrassing. He should be embarrassed. I think that's why they they fought so hard to keep these letters secret. Patriot is loving this. Right, Carol, right. What about Carol being innocent? I mean, he said in the first part of that statement that it was so important that everyone is afforded the innocent until proven guilty standard. Yes, Buzz Lightyear, the witnesses went and spoke to Morrissey. That's right. Why? Yep. If you weren't here in the beginning, we covered that. That's how he found out about the federal investigation. They didn't call him. The witnesses called him. And then AUSA Joshua <clears throat> Levy, I keep wanting to say Levy, called him to tell him. So he found out through the back door. 
but get psyched. They always say, we have the best procedures in place. They never say if they followed procedure. Hi, Lita. Hello, addicts. Hit the way in. I mean, hit the like button on your way in. Put your put your DNA on the like button. Jennifer, this is so disturbing. Citizens should be concerned. Scott, doesn't it say on a subpoena not to tell anyone? That's a great question, and I would love to see the actual subpoenas that they were served with. Hmm. Woot woot. Thanks, CC. Hit the thumbs up. Thanks, CC. All right, let's get back to these letters, shall we? So we just read the August 3rd letter, then we looked at the August 25th statement that Marcy pre-taped. Before we get to this October letter, oh, we have a little bit of a hearing to watch. This is a discovery uh, motions hearing that was from September 15th of 2023 when the defense firm was still trying to get discovery. So Marcy gives his statement on August 25th. Here's what happened in court on September 15th for those of you who don't may not recall. This is Eliza Little, who is no relation to me, by the way. No relation. I mean, maybe she could be my daughter, but she's not. We're not related. I just want to point that out. I have no personal interest in this case. I do not know the defense attorneys. I have never met any of the defense attorneys. I do not know anyone personally who is involved in this case. So you can take those theories uh, and you know who you are. And they are not true. Never spoken to the defense firm. Never spoken to the defendant. I have nothing to do with this case other than a personal interest in this case because when I started looking into it on my own, I just couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. I have a lot of friends who live in Norfolk, Sharon, Wellesley, Rentham, Natick, Needham. Got them? Needham. Got them. Needham. And... I grew up in a lot of these towns because a lot of my friends lived there because I went to summer camp, sleepaway camp in the Northeast. A lot of my friends are from there. So this became a personal case for me because of my personal ties to people who live in the area. For no other reason than that, I am not friends with anybody. I'm not being paid by anyone to make these videos. There it is. Here. Is a less a little. Thank you, Your Honor. It has now been a year and a half since Ms. Reed was arraigned in Norfolk Superior Court. A year and a half, and the defense still has not been allowed to so much as look at the physical evidence that the Commonwealth has had in its possession for 21 months and has so desperately withheld from the defense out of fear of what it might show. That is unacceptable. That is unconstitutional. And that clearly violates the mandatory discovery provisions set forth in Rule 14. <coughs> As I informed the court, there are five categories of mandatory discovery that continue to be withheld by the Commonwealth. And I'd like to go through, through those in turn. There are first 56 items of physical evidence that we have been un unable to view, unable to independently test. Are these the items that are at the lab for testing? still judge says are these the items that are still out for testing okay so let's just put this in perspective for a second september 15th of 2023 a little over 120 days ago this case is going to trial on march 12th john o'keefe officer john o'keefe was killed on january 29th of 2022 What is that, a year and eight months? A year and nine months? They still 
have not been provided with 56 items of physical evidence, including his clothing, samples, DNA samples, hair samples, skin samples, the taillight pieces. So when the DA's office is telling the AUSA and the Office of Professionals and Responsibility that they're aware of their obligations under Brady to turn over all the exculpatory evidence and they want to do it real fast. So please, 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 please give us what you have in your federal investigation so that we can timely turn it over to the defense. Keep that in mind because this is in September of 2023 after all of the letters that we just read were already exchanged because we're doing this in, in chronological order. That's correct, Your Honor. It includes all of the taillight pieces, all of Mr. O'Keefe's clothing, and all samples taken from Mr. O'Keefe's clothing and person. This is the seminal evidence in this case. Your Honor, this is not a complex legal issue. The United States Constitution, the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, and Rule... You know what? I just want to, I want to speed this up a little tiny bit. Because uh, she speaks slow enough that we can, we can speed this up. I tried it earlier to uh, one and a half and it still sounds pretty much normal if you guys think it's too fast. Because there is a lot of this that I want to play. Uh, if you think it's too fast, let me know. all require that Ms. Reed be permitted to inspect and independently test this evidence. Rule 14 could not be more clear. Quote, the prosecution shall disclose to the defense and permit the defense to discover, inspect, and copy material and relevant tangible objects at or prior to the pretrial conference. Our first pretrial conference was on August 12th, 2022. The compliance... August 12th of 2022 was their first pretrial conference. And at that conference, you set a discovery schedule. And you put in writing dates by which you need to provide certain discovery. Date for mandatory defense access to this physical evidence was more than a year ago. In opposing this motion. So more than a year ago, more than a year prior to this motion, they were required to turn over all of this physical evidence that she is now arguing that they still have not received. It's egregious, in my opinion. They have the right ability and necessity to test all this stuff on their own. And as your honor noted, the Commonwealth has tried to excuse its blatant discovery violations by claiming lab protocols and procedures simply won't allow us to access this evidence. But lab protocols and procedures are of no legal moment, your honor. They don't trump the law. In fact, rule 14 actually contemplated that this might be an excuse that the Commonwealth gave. It specifically says it doesn't matter if the physical evidence is not in the physical, actual, tangible possession of the Commonwealth. If that evidence is in the possession of any agency who participated in investigating and evaluating the case and reports to the prosecutor, which clearly the Massachusetts State Police Lab does, then discovery is mandatory. That's rule 14. As this court well knows, this is not the first time we requested access to the physical evidence in this case. So when Mr. Lally stands up, as I believe he probably will, and says, we're almost done testing, the defense can have access to this in 30 days, I wanna remind this court that we've been here before. In fact, we argued this exact same issue before the court six months ago. And I think it's important for the court to be reminded of the representations that were made by Mr. Lally at that hearing. On February 8th- Okay, listen up, because six months before this, they had a conference and here's what Lally told them then of this year, Mr. Lally stood here in open court and made these promises. Quote, I did speak with the lab earlier this week, as well as last week, a couple of weeks ago, and on several different occasions. But my expectation from what I'm told is that their analysis and report should be complete within the next 30 to 60 days. Those were Mr. Lally's words in February. And my guess is that's what he's going to say today. But what is disturbing about those representations is that the crime lab actually keeps track 
of their communications with Mr. Lally. Mm -hmm. And when you review the crime lab conversation log, which was produced to us in Discovery. Oh, you tell him, girl, you tell him. About a month ago. This is what you see. Quote, note to file. Date, January 3rd, 2023. Entry by John Buello. Person contacted, ADA Lally. Note, quote, emailed Commonwealth prosecutor on 11-21-2022 about the status of testing. No response back. Therefore, the trace items will not be tested at this time. If for any reason testing is needed, the items can be resubmitted to the lab for potential analysis. Trace assignment closed, no report. And what you also see is that between January 3rd, 2023, which is the date of that entry, and the date the Massachusetts State Police Lab apparently closed this case, and February 8th, which is the date that Mr. Lally stood here in court and made those representations that he was so desperately trying to expedite testing, there is not a single record of communication between Mr. Lally and the lab that's contained in that conversation log. That's not Mr. Lally's hands being tied by lab protocols and lab procedures. In fact, the assignment was closed because he failed to answer his emails. That is deception, Your Honor. So when the Commonwealth stands up and says that the defense can have access to the physical evidence in 30 or 60 days, that's not good enough. We need court intervention. We need this court to order the Commonwealth immediately provide us access to these critical items of evidence and set a date for compliance, because that's what the law requires. That brings me to the second category of evidence that we're missing. Your Honor, for quite some time, we've been asking for access to the Lexus infotainment system and the Lexus telematics system. As of this morning, our expert was able to get in touch with Trooper Garino, and they're currently working on coordinating a time to hopefully analyze that evidence. Um, I'm hopeful that the Commonwealth will be forthcoming and allow us to, to obtain our own analysis. Um, if there are any issues, we will plan to file a proposed protocol for the examination of that evidence with the court, but I'm hopeful it won't come to that. They still haven't been presented with the murder weapon, allegedly, the alleged murder weapon, which is the car. They still have not been able to have their expert examine the Lexus infotainment system. It's September of 2023 when this hearing was held. The third category of evidence is the handwritten notes of law enforcement. As this court is aware, it was filed with our papers, law enforcement was ordered to preserve all handwritten notes taken in connection with this case. That was done in Staten District Court on February 2nd, 2022. And I know your honor sort of reaffirmed that order just in passing during one of the court appearance when we asked her to renew it. Um, we know law enforcement took copious notes in this case because most if not all of the reports were drafted weeks, even months after the actual interviews or investigation took place. We went over that. We went over that. The statements that were taken on January 29th of 2022 were not typed up until something like April. Where are the notes? They were not recorded. They were not audio recorded. They were not video recorded. So there must be notes. They were asked to turn them over in February of 2022. Here we are in September of 2023, and they are still not turned over. Um, we're asking for the court to immediately set a compliance date for production of those notes. Um, if the Commonwealth has nothing to produce, then we also need confirmation of that because it's in violation of a court order. The, third, the fourth category are reports, handwritten notes, and mapping documenting the recovery of evidence from the Albert residence. This information should have been produced over a year ago. Um, if you were to review all of the police reports in this case, as we've done, then you might mistakenly believe that there were only two searches of the lawn of 34 Fairview Road that resulted in the recovery of TLIP. Listen up if you're not as familiar uh, uh, with this case as many of these viewers today are. I'm going to rewind that. Only two searches over a year ago. Um, if you were to review all of the police reports in this case, as we've done, then you might mistakenly believe that there were only two searches of the lawn of 34 Fairview Road that resulted in the recovery of taillight pieces. Those searches were on January 29th at 5.45 p.m. by the search team, and there was a second search on February 3rd, 2022. But those reports are not complete. 
because according to photographs of the evidence bags in this case, which we just received on July 25th, Trooper Proctor claims to have actually recovered taillight pieces over the course of five additional undocumented searches of the Albert residence throughout the month of February. Five additional undocumented searches of the property during February, but didn't DA Morrissey just say during his statement that Proctor was never at 34 Fairview? Am I in the twilight zone here? Isn't that what he said? Hey, Uncivils. Hi. Thanks for coming over. Thanks, Kurt. Five undocumented searches of Proctor at the location. Only reason we even know about these searches is because when Trooper Proctor logged these pieces into evidence, he had to write his name, the date, and the place those pieces of taillight were supposedly found, 34 Fairview. That's five undocumented searches, Your Honor. We don't have a police report for any of those. No notes, no reports, no photographs. Oh yeah, John Monagle, he said he was never at 34 Fairview that day. Oh, see? Very important choice of words. Right, he wasn't on scene that night except for those other five undocumented searches for when he had to log in those taillight pieces. Oops. Am I crazy? Sometimes I start to think that I'm crazy. She's not making this up. This is in the logs. This is in the police logs. It's in the evidence logs. She's not making this up of where those taillight pieces were found in the yard. No memorialization of the individuals who called Trooper Proctor to the scene. That is not acceptable. If this information exists, we're entitled to it. We need a short compliance date for the production of these notes and reports so that we can at least attempt to prevent further fabrication of evidence. The fifth category of evidence, Your Honor, is the raw data associated with the CERT team search on January 29th at 5.45 p.m. We received um, a, a disc this morning from Mr. Lally. I obviously have not had a chance to, to review that yet, so I don't know what's actually contained on it. Um, this has become somewhat of a pattern in this case. So I'm hopeful that everything's on there, but I, I'm not able to guarantee that for the court. Um, he also indicated that there are additional materials that are forthcoming. Obviously we haven't received those yet. I'm asking the court to set the compliance date to make sure that we actually get the information that we've requested. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lally. Your Honor, I'm not quite done. Oh, you said there were five. <laughs> I love that. I was going to have a conclusion if I okay. may okay. finish addressing the question. Sure. Thank you. Your Honor, we are entitled to this discovery and we need compliance deadlines. Ms. Reed has a constitutional right to a speedy trial and to prepare and present her defense. The law is clear that Ms. Reed was supposed to have access to all of the requested information in August of last year. Respectfully, Your Honor, we're asking you to please enforce these rules and get Ms. Reed the discovery that she's entitled to. Thank right. you. Thank you. Come on. Okay, let's see what Lally has to explain for himself. Most of what I believe uh, was just addressed uh, was uh, dealt with in Hamel's uh, response. Don't worry, he's um, going to have to go to the microphone. Sure, he's speaking in a microphone right in front of him, but if you can't hear him, can you go over to the podium, please? Fine. So, Your Honor, I believe most of this... The judge actually said to Ms. Little one day, Recently, I think, we stand here in Massachusetts. She is from L.A. She is part of the Alan Jackson firm, who's also from L.A. Um, but I would say <laughs> in New York, you come to the podium to speak. You don't stand up to, to speak to the judge with your back to your adversary or your back to your brother, as they say in Massachusetts, or they just started saying in Massachusetts recently. My brother, my sister, apparently they call attorneys that in court in Massachusetts. And that just happened when it was Elizabeth Proctor's attorney, right? Who started that recently when they were trying to fight, when they were arguing the motion that Elizabeth Proctor's cell phone records should not have to be turned over. He started saying my brother, my sister, and then I think everyone else picked it up. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
I've addressed in the Commonwealth's response. And just to be clear, it's not an opposition uh, to the defendant's motions. Uh, the Commonwealth is well aware of its uh, discovery obligations under Rule 14, but it's not opposed uh, the defendant. Uh, <laughs> we know that we're well aware of our discovery obligations because um, the first assistant DA of Norfolk County and Michael Marcy both repeated that extensively in their correspondence with the U.S. Attorney and the Office of Professional Responsibility. So, Judge, we're, we're well aware of our obligations under Rule 14 to turn over evidence and also to turn over all Brady material, but we're still not going to do it. And this makes me wonder, too, based on the, the letters that we just read, was there a reason they were withholding some of this evidence because they needed to see what the feds had? I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. But this is September 15th of 2023, and there's 56 pieces of physical evidence that have not been turned over to the defense. I have to slow him down because he does speak fast. Having access to these items, it's merely a, uh, an issue of timing. Now, I mean. as it pertains uh, to uh, the first uh, enumerated item, and there, there's been various modifications of this, and what I would say is that the Commonwealth is very uh, aware of its ongoing uh, obligations under Rule 14A1A, under Rule 14A4, uh, as it pertains to uh, mandatory reciprocal discovery and exculpatory evidence, and has provided uh, counsel for the defendant with we're close to 300 items of discovery at this point. So it, it, this is not a situation in which the Commonwealth is, is I would submit, withholding evidence or uh, preventing uh, the defendant from uh, doing any, uh, receiving any discovery. As soon as the Commonwealth receives it, it's, it's provided to counsel. Um, there was somewhat of an issue uh, at some point uh, over the history of this case where uh, I had been providing discovery to Mr. Yanetti that apparently wasn't making its way to, uh, to either Ms. Little or Mr. Jackson. Okay, but that's not the case right now with these other 56 pieces of evidence. Don't try and blame it on Mr. Yanetti for not forwarding your emails. Come on. Uh, my remedy for that has been to provide whatever I can, especially documentary evidence and attachments and emails so that it goes to all counsel and all counsel have access uh, Oh, and, and and also the amended police report that I turned over, because the police report that I turned over at the arraignment had um, Brian Albert's cell phone number, his real cell phone number, and also a scene photo from the real scene. But then the one that we turned over in Discovery months later, or maybe a year later, had a different cell phone number for Brian Albert, and also a different scene photograph. So there's that to it, which caused some of the delay as far as the testing in the lab uh, is concerned in the first place. Uh, the lab was uh, prepared to conduct its initial DNA testing back in May, had to wait until uh, July, uh, and then uh, there was a second subsequent exhaustive testing, uh, which uh, wasn't conducted until August 1st uh, because of the timing in which we received uh, the exhaustive authorization form uh, from counsel. Uh, what I can say is Ms. Little and Mr. Jackson were uh, very good as far as as soon as they were made aware of the issue. They uh, executed the forms. I received them, forwarded them to the lab the same day. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, all of the uh, DNA testing was not able to be completed on that July date because of uh, how late we received uh, that particular um, assignment. As far as um, the items uh, that are contained uh, at the lab, Again, these are the lab's policies, they're not my policies. There's nothing as far as uh, anything that the district attorney's office or myself has done, uh, any suggestion that we're desperately withholding evidence from the defendant. Okay, um, labs do take a long time, but dude, it's been a year and eight months. It's been a year and eight months, that's a lot. That's a long time. This is September, the trial's in March, hello? defense as we're afraid of what it might show is, is just patently ridiculous. The items that are at the lab are, there's no objection to counsel swabbing anything from any of those samples, inspecting them, photographing them, doing whatever they would like with them. The issue is when the lab is done. And as I detailed in the motion, there was a recent uh, trace assignment uh, that was completed, uh, not recent, but uh, several months ago actually. And it had to do with item 3-1 and several uh, other items pertaining to the, uh, the taillight. 
And so 3-1 is the uh, passenger side rear tail light of uh, the defendant's SUV. Uh, item 7-5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 19 were all pieces uh, that were recovered uh, from uh, the area uh, where Mr. O'Keefe's body was discovered uh, in front of 34 Fairview Road. Now, each of those were subject to a comparison analysis in which they were uh, essentially uh, fitted back together uh, with item 3-1, which was the actual unit uh, from the defendant's SUV. That was believed to be done. So the lab at that point had made a forensic link and was uh, believed to have been done with testing related to that. Subsequent to that, uh, there was a subsequent uh, discovery uh, based on some additional testing in relation to item 7-18.18. And that essentially was microscopic pieces. And when I say microscopic, uh, they measure approximately, probably less than one sixteenth of an inch of uh, clear and red plastic pieces that were recovered from the victim, Mr. O'Keefe's clothing. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, the chief of Canton PD, you guys in the chat will correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the chief of Canton PD on his own one day drove by 34 Fairview just happened to notice another piece of taillight, I think a big piece on the front lawn. How many days later was that? A week? Five days? Nobody told him to go investigate the scene. He just happened to drive by the house, happened to look out his window, and happened to see it. Yes, that did happen. Former chief. Oh, he's the former. Did he retire too? That's what I want to know, Jody. That's what I don't understand. Since when does the state drag their feet during a murder investigation of a police officer? Was it, it was 10 days later, Heidi? So Brian Albert, who's the homeowner, it's also a Boston police officer, detective sergeant, former now, because I think he retired too, and was also a member of the fugitive task squad or task force. His One of his brothers was a police officer at Canton PD. You just can't, you just can't script this case any better. So he found it on top of the front lawn, on top of the snow, like a week later, they used a, a, a leaf blower at the scene to blow snow away, to look for evidence the Canton PD did. So those of you who are not <laughs> so familiar with this case, I have a playlist now about, I don't know, five or six videos. This is probably my seventh one. He's going to go on and on and on with Abada, 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 abada. Or as like they said on Seinfeld, yada, yada, yada. I don't even know if they've turned over all this stuff. But what I do know is there were no tissue samples of John O'Keefe's right arm taken. They were not taken. And we know that because we have receipts. I'm not going to even let him speak anymore because this sort of it upsets me to listen to because I just can't. I just can't with the excuses. I just can't with the public statements. I just can't. And there are people who have set up accounts on Twitter, who have been on Twitter for a year, that only tweet about this case. So for one year, there is one person who has... 3,900 tweets only about the Karen Reed case. I don't even feel like doing the math, but what is that, like 10 tweets a day? I, I, it's insane. The spin that's trying to go on here. And I mean, you don't have to believe me, but just take a look at the evidence. And if you were sitting on the jury, what would you say? Would you say... Hmm. It's crazy. They are. They're wicked. I've never seen such vitriol in any case. Bob, where he probably found it behind the can station where they broke the taillight. That's what people think. There is a timeline issue with the time that Tr Proctor had the car towed from Dighton, where Karen's parents live, back all the way back to Canton PD. The time on his report was incorrect because the defense came up with ring camera footage from Karen's parents and had the receipt. There's about an hour and 17 minute discrepancy, right? That he was alone with that car. Listen, reasonable doubt. 
When I was on court TV, Vinny said, I don't want to talk about reasonable doubt. And I'm saying, but reasonable doubt is all we, all a jury needs to hear. And then Peter Ellican, who was the defense attorney that was on with me the other night, he said, there's enough reasonable doubt here to drive a truck through. Thank you, Michael Wilson, for that. 114 minutes. It's a huge discrepancy in reasonable doubt. Yes, it, I, I say so too. Hi, Tom CPU. Welcome. The trolls are encouraged. They give you clicks, chat messages, and great content for the algorithms. And you know what they do also? They post my stuff on Twitter. So I guess I should th say thank you. Thank you. I'm not a twit. I'm not a Twitter person. I'm, I never have been. I have an old account, but I don't use it, so I don't really get it. And so, but unfortunately, I, I've seen the worst of it. I thought Reddit was bad, but I, I got to say that I think Twitter is worse <laughs> when it comes to like trolls. I don't know. What say you, my friends? What say you? <gasps> All right, moving on. So this is after this hearing of September fifteenth of twenty twenty three. This is a letter to Josh Levy from the district attorney's office. Dear First Assistant Levy, this is to follow up on our previous communication dated May 9th and your June 12th, 2023 response. On September 15th, the Norfolk Superior Court set a trial date of March 12th, 2024 in Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. So that was the hearing that we just looked at. And that is when the judge set the trial date for March, knowing that they still hadn't turned over 56 pieces of physical evidence and also that the defense firm had not been able to have access to the Lexus or its infotainment system. Sets a trial date for six months out. I don't know. Seems a little quick when all this stuff has been really, they've been dragging their feet. Um, handing it out, my opinion. But I've never seen such a slow discovery process in my 30 years of practice, but it's just me. Superior Court set a trial date of March 12th, 2024 in Commonwealth versus Karen Reed on the indictments for second degree murder, manslaughter while operating under the influence and leaving the scene of personal injury and death. Under the Massachusetts Rules of Criminal Procedure, mandatory discovery includes items and information within the Commonwealth's possession, custody, or control relevant to the case, including statements by the defendant Karen Reed, statements of persons who testify before a grand jury and grand jury minutes, facts of an exculpatory matter, material and relevant police reports, photographs, tangible objects, reports of physical examination of any person, and scientific tests and experiments, and statements of persons intended to be called as witnesses and disclosure of promises, rewards, or inducements made to witnesses where the party intends to present a trial. Well, that's interesting because now they want to know whether anybody who testified in front of the federal grand jury and also testified in Karen Reed's grand, initial grand jury if any of those witnesses were promised anything for their testimony, like, mm, I don't know, mm, immunity, <laughs> immunity. Can you say it with me? Immunity. Just thinking out loud here, I'm not saying it's true or not. Uh, that's where my brain goes. The Commonwealth also has the duty to notify the defendant of items under rule 14 that are known to exist but are not within the care, custody, or control, and to provide all information known as to the item's location and the identity of the persons possessing that item. Well, they weren't too um, concerned with producing the 56 pieces of physical evidence, um, which is less than a month before this letter was written, that hearing that we just watched. To effectuate discover, our discovery obligations, we are requesting statements to investigators and grand jury minutes of witnesses in your investigation, as well as, to the extent they may exist, any of the other described items above or materials. Given the impending trial date, prompt disclosure is critically important. 
So it's critically important that you feds turn over to us right away all of this critically important information that could really kill our case because we need to turn it over promptly, unlike all of the other evidence that we didn't turn over promptly. Or we need to be careful that what we turn over from here on out doesn't conflict with the information that you already have. If there is need for a limited disclosure of such items, um, please include such a request. We are willing, with the appropriate foundation, to file a motion for a protective order under mass law to request limitation of the disclosure of the information to defense counsel only. Any decision of such request, of course, is solely within the authority of the Norfolk Superior Court Judge, Canoni. Similarly, we are willing to facilitate the process or to request under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 6E3B for authorization from a federal district court judge for production of the grand jury minutes and related material, if any, and to discuss, per that rule, under what conditions that material may be released for use in the state judicial proceeding. So we're, we're willing to go the extra mile and do all of this extra work to help you give us this information really quickly because we really, 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 really want to know what you have. Additionally, this office has a constitutional and state obligations to provide exculpatory information of which we are aware in all cases, including exculpatory information relating to all witnesses and or members of the prosecution. This would include any investigations into misconduct related to professional duties. If any such information exists, it is imperative that we learn of it in a timely matter. And this is like, what, our fifth letter to you saying, please, 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 please give us what you have. It is imperative. Again, we can't say imperative too many times because if we keep saying it, it will be imperative. It is imperative that at the earliest opportunity, we are able to provide discovery to the defendant. At the earliest opportunity, <laughs> unlike the opportunity that we've had since January of 2022 to September of 2023, when we still didn't turn over all the basic stuff that we were supposed to, but hey, what abs, no big whoop, right? If the investigation remains ongoing, we request notice of that status and information as to when the investigation may be concluded. In particular, whether the investigation is anticipated to conclude prior to the March 2024 trial date. We want the information. We need the information. You're not giving it to us. This is in November of 2020. 23, November 22nd of 2023. And this may be my favorite letter of all. And I want you to know, I haven't watched anybody else's coverage on this intentionally. I have not watched anybody else's coverage on this. I know a lot of other people did it. I know some people did it last night. I know some people did it today. I have not watched anyone else's coverage because I wanted to come at you with my fresh take on this. I did read all the letters ahead of time and underline them appropriately. And let me tell you, it's like a pain in the neck to... Uh, convert these documents into some other program and then underline them. It's a whole thing, but I'm not a techie, so that's my excuse. All right. This is a letter from Michael Marcy to special agent in charge, Jody Cohen at the FBI, dated November 22nd, 2023. It's like right around Thanksgiving time. This is my favorite. Dear SAC Cohen, it was a pleasure to meet you at the State House for the Governor's Press Conference on Hate Crime Enforcement. I wanted to again extend my welcome and best wishes to you in your role as the Boston Special Agent in Charge and look forward to working with you in the future. I also want to renew this office's offer for your agents to speak to the state police who were involved in the John O'Keefe Canton murder investigation. Again, not Boston police officer John O'Keefe, not hmm, one of your own law enforcement brothers who also serves the city of Boston right alongside special agents in charge, the FBI 
Boston office, not right alongside perhaps, but, you know, sacrifice their lives to keep people safe. Just John O'Keefe Canton murder investigation. My first assistant district attorney also mentioned our willingness to talk to the FBI, to the acting U.S. attorney in a recent phone conversation. So they're calling, they're emailing, they're faxing. Nobody's getting back to them. You can see the frustration building up while as we read these letters. If you'd like to have your investiga investigators talk to the state police, they can contact Detective Lieutenant Brian Tully at this phone number. I don't know, I'm just going to... It's just a hunch that I have. Not just a hunch, because, you know, there were at least two people that told Marcy that they got subpoenas to come and testify in front of a federal grand jury, going back to his first letter, which was, what, May 9th of 2023? They've already testified in front of a federal grand jury. Proctor. Other state police troopers, likely. Buchanick. Marcy wants to now offer a special invitation for special agent in charge, Jody Cohen, to come and talk to them again? Huh. Who's, the, the, the CC here is Colonel John E. Mon Jr. I don't know who that is. If anybody has any information on who Colonel John Mon is, let me know. And Detective Lieutenant Brian Tully. That is the eighth and final letter, but... You may recall these letters were under seal, and so we couldn't see them. And the uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office was served with a copy of the motion to keep these letters under seal by the Commonwealth, and then they sent a letter to the court, Joshua Levy's office, because now he is the acting U.S. Attorney, replacing Rachel Rollins, in that letter on January 12th of 2024 to Justice Canoni says, Dear Justice Canoni, with respect to the above captioned matter, we received notice via letter dated January 9, 2024 from counsel for the defense regarding the Commonwealth's motion for protective order pertaining to Commonwealth's notice of discovery pursuant to mass criminal procedure rule 14 with associated six attachments. We additionally received copies of the motion the defendant's opposition and related filings, including copies of the eight letters at issue. We also are aware of the upcoming hearing scheduled for January 18th, 2024. We appreciate the opportunity to be heard on this issue. Having reviewed all of the materials referenced above, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts do not object to public disclosure of the correspondence at issue in the pending motion. Sincerely, or very truly yours, Joshua Levy, by his assistant U.S. attorney. After that letter was sent to the court, the prosecution, the Commonwealth, had no other option but to withdraw their motion and let the judge unseal the letters. And that's what happened last night. And so we got them and we got a chance to read them. And what say you? What say you, my friends? February 15th is the next time this case will be heard in court. We went over this at length, I think, in the last stream when we covered the hearing that was just held on Zoom. And Mr. Yanetti said on Zoom that the day prior to that Zoom hearing, they had a conference call between Lally. Yanetti and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And the U.S. Attorney's Office said that they will be turning over materials from their investigation that have to do with the Karen Reed case. They're going through the motions. They're jumping through the hoops. It's called the TUI process to turn over these materials to both sides in the Karen Reed case because, quote, in good conscience, we cannot let this case go to trial, end quote. There was a, a statement put out by the U.S. Attorney's Office later that night correcting something else that Yanetti said, 
which semantics, but they did not correct that portion of what was said in court. And I found that to be very telling. So again, it's not just what they say, it's what they don't say. So when the U.S. Attorney's Office came out and said, we never told Yanetti, or we never said in the conference call that Marcy was the target of the investigation, if you go back and you listen again to what Yanetti says, he didn't say the U.S. Attorney told me that. He said, Marcy knows he's the target of the investigation based on these letters. The U.S. Attorney's Office corrected that and said, we never said who the target of this investigation was, but they did not correct that we cannot in good conscience allow this case to go to trial. So that is very telling. Jennifer says, without even sharing my opinions on what may have happened, I can say this entire investigation was bungled up from the very beginning. I think a lot of people feel that way. I think a lot of pe people feel that way. People that have really read the court file and have really watched all of the hearings. And it, it reminds me that that is when I started getting really, real. I mean, I already was interested in this case, but I started getting really interested in it when I saw that hearing in September. And I guess I was flipping channels and it came on and I was transfixed. Like, what? 20 months and they haven't turned over 56 items of basic discovery? That's egregious. And yet in their letters, they proclaim to understand their obligations under Brady and Rule 14. And yet, even the time when those letters were flying back and forth, they weren't turning over discovery. So they ring hollow to me. Uh, what say you, my friends? What say you? Thank you for your super sticker. George Soros, U.S. Attorney Rollins exposed $30 billion lawsuit. That's your handle. Thank you for getting in there with Super Chat. So uh, appreciate that. Wicked Psyched, thanks for your $5 Super Chat. Incompetence is as dangerous as corruption. Sharon, thank you for becoming a new member. Catherine White, thanks for your Super Chat. They have reasons to withhold, and it's sad. Catherine White, again. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards on these. Maybe you meant to send the other one first. Thanks for your 999 Super Chat. One would only withhold evidence, 56 pieces to be exact, if it didn't fit their agenda. I mean, I think that's what a reasonable juror would think, right? It doesn't take 20 months for the lab to do their testing. Michael Martin, thanks for your $5 super chat. Isn't this potentially jury tampering? Taint the jury pool before Jeopardy attaches. On which side? On both sides? On the DA side? I think allegations could be made against both sides for jury tampering, but I don't know if they rise to that level because the jury hasn't been, there's no jury seating right now, seated. Jury pool tampering? Maybe, maybe not. I think they're, they're hearing, uh, I don't know. But jury tampering, there has to be an actual jury seated for jury tampering charges to attach. Paige, thanks for your $4.99 super chat. What about Karen Reed's entitlement to a thorough, detailed, unbiased investigation? He doesn't seem concerned about that. No, he seems concerned to figure out what they've got because they really, 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 really need to turn it over really, really, really quickly under all of the discovery rules under Brady. And they have to explain the discovery rules and Supreme Court cases to the Department of Justice and the Office of Res Professional Responsibility, which I find to be, I don't know, a little um, not necessary, <laughs> unnecessary. I don't know, just saying. Hi, Dixie. Thanks for your $10. Super chat your eyes and legal expertise in this case are both incredible. Thank you. You are so very sweet. And there's Sharon again. She's senior, but not senile. What say you, my friends? What say you? At a 614, maybe everyone wants to go have a break for dinner before everyone goes to watch Brian on LTL stream the Canton uh, select meeting tonight. Tom CBU, how does Canton a Police Department instill confidence in their officers with this being allowed and encouraged to happen. I mean, that's what, I don't know, Tom, I think you're local. I'm not local. But when people say on television and on other places, like, this is so ridiculous, this could never happen. 
Uh, I say it, it can happen. It will happen. It does happen. It happened here in Suffolk County, New York. And that's why the Long Island serial killer wasn't caught in 2010. He was just arrested in 2023 because of the police corruption at the very high levels of Suffolk, the district attorney, and the chief of police. And I'm not saying all cops are bad. I bleed blue. I back the blue 100%. I have law enforcement in my family, friends. I back the blue 100%. Let's not forget that John, Officer Don O'Keefe is also blue. Um, it can happen. I am not saying all cops are bad. I am not saying that. I respect the badge. I respect the blue. There are some bad apples in every career. Bad priests, bad law enforcement, bad lawyers, bad politicians. Not everyone is bad. Hey, New Hampshire woman. Uh, thank you for thanking me for going over this. Uh, Montgomery is coming soon. And uh, we will be going over that one as well. Jody 617, she would have been forced to take a plea like they bet it on. Truth. James Lynch says, go back and watch Serpico. Tom CPU is a former law enforcement. He loves police officers too. I don't think that's what anybody who is following this case is doing. Trashing all law enforcement. Um, but when people sit by and don't, speak out or at least try and educate the public. Okay. I'm here not because somebody told me to be here not because I saw somebody else's coverage of this, but because I thought it was important to educate people about what goes on out there. And Karen Reed could be any one of us. And if this was you or your sister or your daughter or your mother or your wife, it's frightening. And it could be. That's the thing. If it turns out the way I think it's going to turn out, amen, says M. February 15th, I think, is going to be explosive. If they get the information from the feds that I think they're going to get, this whole case could, could turn in a different direction. And... Um, it will be in large part to people who brought attention to this in the very beginning. You know who I'm talking about. Heidi Costa, till this day, the CW hasn't done an accident reconstruction. The CW keeps changing their theories on how Karen hit John. I know. I know. There's there's like like the the, the programs that they used on the forensics are like very um, antiquated. They're not the most recent versions of the software. Like it's just, I'm not a forensics expert. I'm not. Uh, I'd love to get one on the show. But um, February 15th is coming up pretty quickly. And maybe the charges will be withdrawn so the DA can save face. Uh, the DA's office can save face. And then none of these motions will have to be argued in open court. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm here for it. BL, there are BPD that should have spoken up. Silence, crickets. I know. I don't see any police presence in the gallery when we watch these hearings. Do you? Where where are they? I don't know who Biff is, but everybody's talking about him in the chat, but I guess I can't see him. I don't know. Oh, thank you, Kirsten. Kristen, this is a Kristen. We have three Kirstens and a couple of Kristens. So Kristen, Massachusetts, thanks you. Thank you. Thank you for thanking me. I mean, it's not. Yep. Yep, Joan Reagan, it is pretty scary. Timothy Daigle, would the phone call between Yanetti prosecutors and feds be released or a transcript of it? Probably not. Probably not. Thank you, Lisa PJ, for thanking me. John Courtney, if they halt the case, will we be able to see the corrupt discovery? If the charges are dismissed, probably not. But the motions to dismiss and the motions. To have for sanctions and the motion to get the DA off the case are all ready filed with the court. They're just impounded. Would they be unsealed? I don't know. That's a great question. That is a great question. Probably. I mean, look, they're unsealing all those um, Epstein documents now, right? So, so I'm thinking 32%. Somebody said here. Oh, thanks, Susan. 
Susan, you keep changing your name, but your profile picture stays the same. So I know who you are. Thanks for your super chat. Best on YouTube. Thank you so much, Millie. Thank you. Uh, a lot of work goes into this. People don't realize how much work goes onto this. They think we just come on here and we don't do any research and we just, but a lot of work does go into this. So thank you for thanking me and for appreciating it and for participating for everybody for participating kindly to each other in the chat, because it's important that people just be kind. I, I just, you know, I look at what's going on on Twitter and I, I like, I'm so, it makes me so upset that my children had to grow up in this world. Because when we were kids, you, my friends, and I know this, if somebody wanted to be nasty to you, they had to either find you outside in the schoolyard or, you know, the worst they could do is drop an anonymous note in your locker. This is like, this is really a horrible thing for our children to have to grow up with. The fact that there are bullies at every corner and everywhere online, and it's just people can hide behind fake names and fake accounts and just completely trash people. And it's, it's terrible. I feel really sorry for our kids. The mental health crisis among kids is another thing that's really out of control in large part, I believe, to social media. But that's my TED Talk. Thanks for coming. Helen, the Scottish Lama, law enforcement are human and can have bad days, the exception being events like this. Hillsborough, unlawful killing of 97 people due to incompetence at one event, which are systemic. Don't feed the bits no business i don't know i don't know scott i guess he's being respectful in a way but okay uh marta and then what nobody will be held accountable for officer o'key's death i don't know marta i don't know unless unless there's a witness unless somebody flipped i was going to testify against whoever was involved but the evidence you know has been out there, so it's hard to know. Thank you, Natalie. Just, you know, Michael Proctor's the investigator for Brian Walls. Yep, somebody else told me that too. Hey, the glare is here. Hey, well. Biff Thunderwad, it's great to see you here. Oh, good. You mean he's trolling you too? You and me? Oh, you know, I guess they do the rounds and we're all on the same day. Um, it's like a party. It's like a big party. I wonder out of the 2,012 people that are here right now, how many of them are hate viewers? I don't know. Let's see. Let's see how many likes we have. I want everyone to put their DNA on the like button. We are it's a thousand likes, if this is accurate right now, and two thousand. So we only have fifty percent likes. So is it fifty percent hate viewers? Come on, you guys! It helps the algorithm. The more likes, the more it helps the stream get out there. So we want the stream out there, don't we? Who cares if they hate as long as they smash the like button? Also, you know what? Hit the subscribe button while you're there. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And if you hit the bell, you will get all notifications of when I go live because I often do not post too far in advance because of my very, very, very busy schedule. And um, so you will know. As long as I schedule at least a half an hour before I go on, you will get a notification. But you have to... Enable notifications on your phone from YouTube so that you will get the notifications. And uh, this is pretty exciting. So I started this channel at the end of June, maybe beginning of July was my first live stream on my own channel. I'm currently at 24,144 subscribers. So let's get to 25,000, yeah? And then we'll have a big party. We'll have a big party at 25,000. We're almost there. Hey, hey, well. Hey, Tom, Tom says, hit that love button. She worked hard for us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Madam Rouse is telling you how to block someone. Touch their profile picture. It'll ask you to block or report. He tells us to block him, and then he comes back with a different account. I know there's so many different accounts, right? Thank you, Kim, for putting your DNA. Just be careful about your Google search history, everyone. Word to the wise. You know, you know that it can, they can get it. Yay, let's get to 25K. That'll be very exciting. Thanks, Scott, for being there since the very, very beginning. Hi, Wendy. Did I go on Court TV prior to this case? No, because I met Vinnie Politan on another channel where we were discussing it. And then after I met him, that's when he called me onto his show for the first time. So that was exciting. 
We were on a, we were on a show. I did a show with Profiling Evil on January 1st. So I didn't know Vinny before that. And then we were both on the show together. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. Karen Reed did come up during that show on Profiling Evil. So um, after I met him, then his people started calling me. So that's how it works. I don't think they just call people out of the blue. I mean, you have to kind of, I don't know, maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know how they work. Polyongs ain't no party like a 25K party because the 25K party never stops. I think so, Kirsten. Kristen, sorry, Kristen. I think somebody will flip. I mean, listen, lying under oath is one thing. But remember also that there are 40 people that testified, I think, at the grand jury, Karen uh, Reed's original grand jury. In what? February-ish, 2022 or before. When she was arraigned in February. I think she was not indicted until June. Sometime during that time. But a lot of the witnesses did not come out or were not known until after. So we don't really know who testified at the grand jury. We know some of the people because they've been mentioned in court papers, but we don't know them all. So some people may have been fresh new witnesses at the federal level and during the federal grand jury. So that's crazy. Chanley is leaving court TV. Hi, Idaho mom reports. Chanley's leaving. And she's so nice. Where's she going? She is very good. She's very good and kind. I like her. Oh, who's lying? Me? I don't know. I'm not even going to pay attention. I can't. I can't pay attention to the trolls. I have way too much drama going on in my own house with teenagers. Like, I can't deal with the other drama. So, hmm. no big whip. All right, you guys. Thank you to all of my moderators. So glad our world collided with this case. You've been amazing, incredibly interesting. But thank you, Violet Lilac. I've been called very, very, very many worse things. And that is a very kind thing for you to say. So thank you. All right, my friends, to my moderators who keep the chat classy. I can't do this without you. Thank you for everything that you do. To my channel members, thanks for liking me enough to want to stick around and actually be a member of my channel. We will be doing a members only very, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. The What Say You merch is up. I'm going to just show it to you real quick. Hold on one second because it's really cute. Somebody said they wanted a crop top that says What Say You. So we're here. I think tomorrow there's a 20% off sale. So wait until tomorrow to buy your merch. So I, don't, I don't control the shop. It's through Spread Search. So... Uh, a spread shop. I mean, let's just take I'll give you a quick peek at this so you can see what it looks like. Isn't that cute? I think it's cute. It's got the cupcake with the line through it. And hold on, let me just make it bigger for you. You can get a mug, you can get a shirt. These are super cute. And then there's other products as well. You can get the tie dye. We love tie dye over here. And as such, other things, they are tacked, attached. We also have Come for the Comments merch. Oh, look, aprons for those of you who cook. Very cute. Everything comes in different colors. You can, it's printed to order, so it's not that fast on the shipping and stuff. But I think tomorrow starts the 20% off sale. I will actually post the sale. So thank you to everyone for watching. Uh, remember to go over to Brian's stream LTL for seven o'clock. So go take a little break right now because you've probably been watching YouTube all day, all day. And now is your time to take a little break before the next thing starts. I may see you over there. You never know. And remember my friends, be cool, be kind, be classy. It's not hard. I'm going to start covering the Crumbly case. The Jennifer Crumbly case is starting. They're in jury selection. I don't know when that case is going to start. I'll be recapping it for you. It is a case of first impression where the parents of a school shooter are being tried for murder because they bought him the gun and they did not stop him from this school shooting. It's going to be a case of first impression and the legal issues in this case are very, very interesting. So I hope you will watch that as well. Take care, my friends. Peace.